Need a flight path. Welcome back everyone, it's Charlie. This will be my full Star Wars and or episode six video. There's a whole bunch of Easter eggs and references, so we'll break it all down. If you're brand new to the channel, I'm doing videos for all the episodes. Be sure to subscribe to get them. Careful for spoilers from the episode if you haven't seen it yet. We'll just start at the beginning and work our way through shot by shot, talking about Easter eggs and WTF moments. But this is basically the actual heist episode. Like they've been talking about the heist for the past couple of episodes. This was the episode where they actually pull it off. I feel like they waited like one episode too long to actually pull off the heist. Like they should have done it a little bit sooner than this. But now we're also halfway through the season. So there's still a lot more to happen, but there are still a lot of big characters like Mod Mothma, for instance, who aren't like core team rebels. Like she's an ally to the rebels, but she isn't officially a part of the rebellion, at least the way that you think of her during the original trilogy. There's also people like Bail Organa, the other major figures that were responsible for helping the rebellion get started who just haven't shown up yet. Also a really cool connection to what's going on with Ahsoka Tano during this part of the timeline. She was also a critical figure early on in the rebellion. Under the codename Fulcrum, she actually handled a lot of the communications between rebel cells. So it'll be interesting to see if there's any reference to her in the background during the series. I'm not expecting it, but it would be really cool. We'll probably get some genuine Ahsoka flashbacks to earlier in her timeline, like after the events of Revenge of the Sith during the Ahsoka series, but most of that's going to take place during the same timeline of the Mandalorian series much later after the events of Return of the Jedi. I'll talk more about the Ahsoka series when we get some more trailer footage for that. But the actual episode title is The Eye, which is a reference to the celestial phenomenon on the planet that's sacred to all the locals. The rebels use it as cover for their mission to steal the payroll and escape. And when they're escaping, when the celestial event sort of converges in the sky, like the way that it looks makes it seem like an actual physical eye that they're flying through. They set up the whole bit with Nemec's new document that he wrote called The Role of Mercenaries in the Galactic Struggle for Freedom, which is meant to be a big question of morality, like he's trying to justify the use of mercenaries during the rebellion because of what they're doing and because the Empire itself is doing things that are so much more terrible. So throughout the episode, they want to show you that even though they do do some terrible stuff, they wind up killing a lot of people, they still aren't quite as big a dirtbags as the Empire are. They also want to show you that they're this hodgepodge group of people from all different parts of the galaxy. Like there are core empire people who have either left the empire to join the rebellion. There are people that are still part of the empire working with them to take it down from within. And you also have a lot of genuine dirt bags, which we find out Skeen is because he basically tries to split the take with him. Like, why don't we just take off with all the money? We could just split it half and half, you and me. But at the end of the day, they don't want to throw all these rebellion characters under the bus that much. They just want to show you that it's a little more complicated than you probably thought it was during the events of the original trilogy, the way they portrayed it in the original movies. Like they're meant to be committed to the cause, but there are some lines that they won't cross, whereas the Empire wouldn't even think twice about stuff like that. We meet a couple of the new Imperial characters at the base. This is Commandant J. Hold. He's Gorn's boss. His rank is kind of like senior superintendent, almost equivalent to a colonel. And the other important character here is Colonel Peltigar, who's the Empire's engineer that's responsible for actually building this much larger version of the Imperial base, destroying their sacred area in the process. Also, they try to tease a little bit of the drama that's going on between the Imperial characters too. Like the whole idea that J-Hold keeps talking about wanting to get off the planet because most of the people that actually work on the planet view it as sort of a punishment. Like they're relegated to duty on this planet and they want to go anywhere else they could possibly go. So even the Imperials here want everything to go as smooth as possible so that they could potentially either get promotions or just get transferred off of the planet. And just to make you feel better about this whole morality question between the rebels, the Empire characters, they have J-Hold basically being the worst person imaginable, talking about the locals like they obviously do not care about any of this, we'll be done with all this nonsense really soon anyway. He insults them, he insults their culture. They also imply that once they actually do start building that new Imperial base, they're going to use the locals as cheap labor to do it. The Emperor wound up enslaving a lot of races and using them to actually construct the Death Star, so it's meant to be sort of a parallel for that. He does care a little bit about his family, it seems like, but he's meant to be a pretty typical type of Imperial officer, like somebody who just wants to uphold the status quo and isn't really thinking about the common person. When they use the Echo One call sign throughout the episode, Han Solo, Luke Skywalker, the other rebels during Empire Strikes Back also used Echo call signs to communicate with each other. Echo Three to Echo Seven. Hano, buddy, do you read me? Loud and clear, kid. What's up? We find out that Barcona used to be a stormtrooper and that's why he seems like he's so ordered and by the numbers with everything. There's a lot of drama within the group also because even though they never showed it, Sintra had her whole family slaughtered by stormtroopers even though he wasn't part of that, like he didn't kill her family. You still get the idea. 
It, along with the reveal of Skeen being a dirtbag at the end of the episode, is just meant to show you that they truly are like a hodgepodge group of people from all different sides of this conflict in the galaxy, just coming together, trying to get rid of the Empire. And even though that is a noble goal, not all the people doing it, like in Skeen's case, are actual good people. Love the look on Goran's face as they all pass by him. He seems pretty pessimistic, like he expects most of them to die during this operation. Velsartha and Sintra enter the base underwater. We haven't seen too many operations specifically underwater outside of Obi-Wan Kenobi recently, and then during Phantom Menace, obviously. The whole thing with the Donnie leader's comments about the ghosts having strong hands and long memories is meant to be a metaphor more for the events of Return of the Jedi and the fall of the Empire, but during the actual episode, they also use it as a metaphor for their heist, like, we're going to get revenge on you very soon. And they continue paying out this whole morality question in tactics when they have to deal with the Commandant's family, like his wife and son are sitting here. Like, you don't feel that bad about the Commandant or Peltigar dying, like, okay, sure, kill them, they're terrible people. But like Velsartha's comment, one path, we win or everyone dies, she's totally committed, like, she actually means what she says. But they at least offer them an out, like, okay, you give us what we want, everybody can live, even though a lot of people wind up dying anyway. So they don't want to completely throw these rebellion characters under the bus, like they are at least willing to avoid violence when they can. It's also meant to show you how committed most of these early rebellion characters are, like the beginning of the rebellion, most of these characters thought that they would die at any given moment. The only real conflict here in the eyes of the Commandant is that if these rebels are successful in getting the payroll, which obviously they are, any of the surviving officers at the base would be severely disciplined and it'd be almost as bad for them as if they'd actually been killed. They pay off the bit about Sintra's bed already being spoken for in an earlier episode, revealing that she's actually in a relationship with Velsartha, not with one of the other dudes, like a lot of people suspected in the comments. The game that the guards are playing here is Sabacc. The celestial event, the eye, hits its peak, and you actually start to see it look like an actual eye. All the TIE fighter pilots taking off are at the airbase nearby that they kept referencing earlier in the episode, like, don't touch those buttons, those are for the airbase. Then the Commandant winds up having a heart attack from all the shock when things go off the rails, RIP. It seems like a mercy death for him, like it could have been way worse for him if the ISB had shown up and he was still alive. My only surprise here is that they didn't get away with the entire payroll haul. Like they said they were trying to take the entire payroll, but you can see like there's stacks and stacks that are still left there. But they say that they got away with about 80 million worth of credits. So it's still meant to be a lot of money. The ISB, the Imperial Security Bureau, is who Deidre, these other characters work for. They're the ones who get called in when stuff like this goes down, like we see at the end of the episode. Like, nobody's going home, I want all the plans about how we deal with this on my desk by midnight. They're the ones that do all the detective work in the aftermath and try to track down the rebels. And if they do wind up finding them and move to attack them in force, that's when they would call in the regular Imperial military characters. But like, that's Deidre's whole thing. She's trying to find the actual rebellion. That's the theory that she's crafting in the background that nobody else believed her about. They pay off the title of the episode, The Eye, as they escape when they fly through the path of the event, which converging looks like it's forming an actual physical eye. And all the little meteorites wind up taking care of most of the pursuing TIE fighters. I guess you could liken this to Han Solo's escape through the asteroid field. When they go back to the ground and you see all the locals enjoying watching the event, doing their regular ceremony, the Imperials that are with them seem like they have no idea what just happened at the base. Like they're all taken with the event like you would normally be if you were just there having fun. Nemec winds up getting his spine crushed by the escape. It doesn't kill him, but he does wind up dying, so RIP. They use this to continue paying off the morality question, and the weird thing here is Skeen, because he's the one that argues to take them to the doctor, but I think the reason why he did that, though, wasn't for the benefit of Nemec, like, he wasn't trying to save him, he was probably just trying to divert them to a place where it would have been easier for him to take off with the gold. But you get the idea, Velsartha does come off as a genuinely good person, like, even though it seems like she wants to let him die, like, no, 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 we need to worry about the mission, she's willing to take him to the doctor and try to get him saved. The Doctor seems like a new type of alien. He doesn't look familiar, but he does have cybernetics that seem similar to Lobot's cybernetics. Skeen's joke about luck is a callback to Han Solo's joke to Obi-Wan Kenobi when he was saying that he believed more in luck as a more probable thing than the Force was, like he didn't believe in the Force controlling his destiny. Kid, I've flown from one side of this galaxy to the other. I've seen a lot of strange stuff, but I've never seen anything to make me believe there's one all-powerful Force controlling everything. There's no mystical energy field controls my destiny. The funny thing about that, though, is that by the time of the sequel trilogy, he totally believed it. Like, oh, yeah, all that mumbo jumbo stuff. Yeah, it's 100% true. Then if it wasn't clear, Andor still doesn't care about the rebellion. He only wants to find his sister, which is why he took off so quickly in the episode. 
But they also want to set up the idea that he's a fundamentally good character who will eventually believe in the rebellion, which is why he kills Skeen, because obviously he'd become a much bigger problem to them in the future if he was revealing this to him at this point. But that's why Andor gives back the kyber crystal, like give this back to Luthen, it belongs to him. And it's why they have him leave with Nemec's manifesto, so to speak, his document about the morality of the rebellion. Like he'll probably read it and slowly come around on the idea of the rebellion so that by the events of Rogue One, he is 100% team rebels. Back at the ISB, predictably, they rally all the officers to plan the Empire's retaliation, tracking down the rebels and the missing money. This also serves as the proof that he had requested from Deidre earlier before they pursued her plan. I don't think she was calling it a rebellion or rebels or anything like that. She hadn't used those terms yet, but that's what she was talking about. It sounds like in next week's episode, she'll go on the attack and she might go back to Ferrix because she kept talking about Ferrix, and that's where a lot of the big characters still are. Then we finally see the Imperial Senate, Mon Mothma is talking about this new fact-finding mission for Gorman. The whole thing with Gorman is that the Empire perpetrated a whole bunch of atrocities there, and she's trying to pass an official motion that they go find out what actually happened. And the whole idea here is that she starts looking around at her fellow senators is that none of them seem like they care or they're listening or they're not even there. Like most of the Senate seems like it's not even in session that day, like they didn't even bother to show up. One of these characters in the background also seems kind of like a C-3PO droid, but this isn't meant to be Bail Organa from Alderaan. He would probably still be here, like he was actually a pretty good senator. I'm sure at some point he'll show up, and C-3PO and R2-D2 belong to him during this part of the timeline, so if he shows up, they might show up, we'll see, but they just showed up earlier in the timeline during the Obi-Wan Kenobi series, so we don't know how much they want them to specifically cameo in all these different Star Wars series. The pad she's looking at, I think is just confirmation of the day's attendance, like, oh, nobody is here, nobody cares about this. And I think this is meant to drive her more in the path of the rebellion, like she's more of an ally to them, like she's helping them get money, but she's not core team rebels right now. I think the idea is that by the end of the series, she'll be more active in the rebellion, like you think of her when you think of Mon Mothma from the original trilogy. My other theory about that too is that they might wind up killing off her husband and her daughter is part of that too. Like something terrible might wind up happening to them and that drives her further towards the rebellion. In most of the cases, the true believers that are part of the rebellion lost someone close to them and that's why they became rebels. Back at Luthen's shop, they mentioned the Deveronians saying that the language that's written on this particular necklace has been lost to time and it's meant to be a good example of why Luthen is doing what he's doing, like what drove him to become part of the rebellion. He's meant to be the student of history, like he reveres all these ancient artifacts. Some of them seem sacred to different cultures, like they have the Force tablets from the Mortis mural during Star Wars Rebels, which is a huge deal. There's probably a lot of other Jedi artifacts here too. He has what seems like the Star Killer armor, and that's just like a small part of it. It just makes you give you this idea that the Empire is basically subjugating all these different cultures, wiping them out, and stealing all their treasures. And that's a big reason why Luthen is doing what he's doing. And they pay off the heist when the random customer references it offhandedly, just letting him know that they were successful. The whole idea with episode 7 next week, though, is it is probably mostly going to be about the ISB, the Empire's retaliation, like what Deidre actually does when she goes on the warpath. It seems like she's headed to Ferrix. Also, Andor previously said that he would return to Ferrix, so it seems like a lot of these characters will come back to Ferrix one way or the other. You also have the idea that Valsartha and Luthen have to decide what to actually do with all that money now that they have it. But if you spotted any other Easter eggs or references in the episode that I didn't talk about in the video, just write them below in the comments. Or if you have any questions about what's actually going on or where they're headed in the series. My full episode 7 video will post next week after they release it. Make sure you enable alerts for my channel so you don't miss that. Everyone click here for my House of the Dragon episode 9 video. And click here for my House of the Dragon episode 8 video. Thank you so much for watching, everyone stay safe, and I'll see you guys in the next one.